Thank you very much for that introduction. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Speaking in the same panel as two Lord Chief Justices is quite forbidding and brought to mind the story I love to tell. And I haven't told it for ages because I haven't actually spoken in public, so forgive me. This is as much of me enjoying giving or telling the tale than you listening to it. But it's a story about Albert Einstein, the great scientist, who apparently many years ago gave a wonderful lecture tour in England. And he got very friendly with a chauffeur who used to drive him to and from the various places at which he was speaking. And one day the chauffeur is driving along the car, Einstein sitting in the back, and he looks in the rear view mirror. He says, Professor Einstein, you really are a remarkable man. What I find amazing is not simply the sophistication of your theories, and clearly they are very complex. It's your ability to break down these theories into simple, straightforward propositions. That's what I find so amazing. In fact, so clear are you, and so many times have I heard you, that I think I myself could give one of your talks. So the Einstein's sitting in the back of the car, he says, well, it's funny you should say this, because I'm getting rather bored of giving the same talk again and again. Why don't we try an experiment? Uh, uh, we're about the same height, so just before we arrive at the lecture theater, I'll climb out of my clothes, get into your chauffeur's uniform, I'll stand at the back of the hall as you would normally do, you can get into my clothes, stand at the front and give the talk, what do you think? Chauffeur thinks this is a wonderful idea. They duly arrive at the lecture theater. Einstein gets out of his clothes, climbs into the chauffeur's uniform, stands at the back of the hall as the chauffeur would normally have done. The chauffeur in Einstein's clothes stands up and gives this stellar lecture. The crowds are going wild. But what they hadn't banked on was question time. And this very eminent physicist stands up and asks this impossibly difficult question about quantum entanglement. The chauffeur's eyes glaze over. But then they light up. He said, that question's so easy, I'm going to ask my chauffeur at the back of the hall to answer it. So similarly, ladies and gentlemen, any difficult questions this evening, I'm going to pass it to the Chief Justices, Lord Chief Justices amongst us. I want to talk about three things tonight. I want to talk about reading, I want to talk about writing, and I want to talk about technology. And of course, I want to congratulate this wonderful charity and the work you do, it's fantastic. So close to my heart because I actually love books and I don't see the end of books anytime soon. But let me say, before I get into the meat of my comments, something about reading. I love reading. Uh, I always have done my, I lived in a home when I was young, it was full of books. Uh, I love books, I collect books. I have an embarrassingly large collection. Uh, my family is the same, my kids. Um, but I, I love this too. I don't go anywhere without my Kindle. And I, f I find that people want to have this discussion about whether or not a Kindle is better than a book and somehow think you're just being disloyal to a book or the concept of books by using a Kindle. Given the choice of sitting at home in front of the fire, I'd much prefer to read a book. Like all of us, we like the feel of it, the smell of it, and so forth. If I'm traveling, as I do a lot, if I'm, in, if I'm on the tube, if I'm sitting on the beach, the Kindle's just more convenient. I think it's wrong to think that you're being disloyal to the concept of a book to enjoy the convenience of a Kindle. I think it's wrong to see them in opposition to one another. And there's a more general lesson here in life, and we've seen it during the COVID period, uh, and I, I'm sure the current Lord Chief Justice will agree that video hearings have generated the same kind of binary response that during the COVID period to keep access to justice and the rule of law up and running, we've conducted hearings through remote courts. Some judges and lawyers are what I say, hankering and unkering. They're hank hankering back for the old way. They want to go back as soon as they can to the old way of w working and they're hunkering down until the viral storm passes. And others are saying, completely the other end of the spectrum, we should never go back. We've seen a new way. I, I don't look at the world in that way. I think for some kinds of hearings, it might be good to hold them online in a variety of ways. And sometimes it will be useful to go back to the old way. So. For some reason, psychologically, it might be a, a slightly combative, adversarial, legal response, but people in the world of law, when people talk about technology, there's a sense that you've either got to be for or against, but I think that is uh, unhelpful at best. I love my Kindle, I, I love my books. How I use my Kindle, if you're interested, because I think this is relevant for today's um, discussion, if it's a sequential linear read from start to finish, like a thriller, and so forth, I'm quite happy to read the Kindle. And interestingly, if I really like a book on my Kindle, I'll buy the physical version of the book because I want to have it, because I like to own the book. I know that's perhaps slightly peculiar. When I'm reading nonfiction, I read a lot of nonfiction. I don't tend, I have to say, 
read all nonfiction from cover to cover. I dip in, I browse. The way I go about reading a piece of nonfiction, particularly when I'm writing, is not this linear sequential read. And the Kindle, and indeed even an online book, are not particularly helpful for that. You do like to have the little stickies. You do, I, I, I deeply object to anyone incidentally turning the corner over of a page. That's just, uh, you sometimes lend people books and they come back and they've turned the corner over. It. It's uh, almost a physical assault, I think. But I very much uh, like the idea when I'm, when I'm researching or I'm thinking to be able to browse through and have six or seven books open and so forth. So again, I don't see that you need to be disloyal to books or be loyal only to the technology. I think we can have a blended future. Will books survive, I think, a question that one might naturally ask. I think they'll survive for two reasons. One, because we like the book as an artifact. Not dissimilar in many ways that people are now buying vinyl again. That people like the idea of having an LP. They, they like the process of putting it on to what my grandfather would have called a gramophone. But that whole concept of the there's a, there's, a, there's a physical process we enjoy, like we enjoy, for example, making coffee. Some people like the taste. We've written about this at length, actually. Like the taste of an espresso coffee, the simple little capsule, but go back in the end to the process because they like the process of making coffee. So sometimes we like artifacts. We like physical objects for their own sake. And I think a book will always remain that kind of item. We like having them in our houses. They give us a sense of warmth, a sense of comfort. So for aesthetic reasons, I do believe that the book will carry on. There's also functional reasons. You may remember the book by Marshall McLuhan, who's the Canadian philosopher in the 60s, who wrote The Medium is the Message. But actually, I do think we should disconnect the content from the method of delivery. Because the content of that book, which is the same there as it is in my Kindle. The method of delivery is different. But the reality is, as I've hinted, sometimes the physical book is simply a better, a more convenient way of actually delivering the content. On the other hand, sometimes uh, the, the technology is better. Uh, out of a matter of interest, of my books, 12% of my books sell on Kindle version and the rest are physical. And I think that suggests, it's, it's usually far more in, in fiction, but it suggests, I think, and it echoes what I'm saying, that people find the delivery mechanism of the traditional book uh, very useful. And that's why I think uh, for the foreseeable future, books will be with us. So that's great. And also they're nice, as I say, nice to collect as well. Let's talk about writing. All I want to say to you about writing, because I'm an author, um, I've written quite a lot of books. I, uh, I just want to encourage everyone in the room to write a book. Other, the, the moment of getting my first book, the, fi the final version of it, other than the moment my children were born and the moment of my wedding, the best moment of my life. It's unbelievable, that moment. You put so much work and effort into it and it arrives, this little parcel, and you, you unpack it and it's just this creation of yours. So much of what we do in life is so transient comes and goes so very quickly. You put your heart and soul for years into this thing, this artifact, uh, and it's a great creation. My father died a few months ago, very sadly, and one of the saddest, but yet in a way happiest things for me when he was going through all his things was he had a, a whole row of all my books. The sad thing is all these inscriptions and so forth, and you wonder, well, and I did wonder, who should I give these books to now? But also I know they brought him happiness, uh, and books bring people happiness. One of the nicest gifts you can ever give people is to leather bind their favorite book. It's just a wonderful artifact. But back to writing, it's a great thing to do. It is actually, it is great, but it's also, it's agonizing. It's exhilarating and agonizing. It's also addictive. You hardly find any authors who don't come back for more. Uh, they usually, towards the end of the writing process, you say never again, but in fact you do, you can't. And I'm not sure why we do it. That's the other thing. Um, I think it's just intrinsically satisfying allowing your ideas to shape, shape to create and craft. If you're, not, if you're not physically very good, as I'm not, at creating very much at sculpture or woodwork, this is the nearest to crafting I think I can get. So I think it's, it's good for its own sake, and it's good to, I think, widen people's horizons. It's good to inform people. It's good to educate people and entertain people. Uh, but it doesn't, as I say, just do it in a transient way. You build up a body of work that you're, you're passing along. The reality is, if we're really honest with ourselves as authors, the average nonfiction book only sells 750 copies. 
So very uh, unfortunate. I've sold a few more in, in mine. The most frustrating thing is my best-selling book is the, is the cheapest and the worst. Uh, books are price sensitive. Uh, people like short, cheap books. That's the big lesson if you want to be an author. And so I see, for example, some great books that cost 75 pounds, and I can guarantee you they're not going to sell more than a few hundred. So if any of you write a book, keep it under 20 pounds, keep it under 10 pounds if you can, and far more people will read it. So the joy of actually crafting the book, the joy of receiving the book is something I just want to pass along to you that all of you in this room are comfortably able to write your own book. If you've never thought of doing it, just give some thought to it. It's, it's wonderful. It's also my favorite uh, um, fiction writer, although not the person I, I chose for this particular book, is, in terms of his, um, his style is Martin Amos. And he talks a lot about writing being a cooperative process. So that, um, and reading being a cooperative process. It's very different from, for example, in fiction, when you watch a film and you go to the cinema and it's all blasted at you, there's actually not much room for interpretation. You're almost overwhelmed. But when you're reading, it's an interpretative process. You're in some kind of relationship with the person who communicated with you and you share the job of creating the world that that person has triggered for you. And similarly, I think in nonfiction, it's not quite as dramatic, but you actually, it's a cooperative process, which hopefully you're taking the reader in a journey. And that's a privilege, I believe. So enough about uh, writing and reading. Let's talk about technology. And I say, first of all, that it's a privilege to be born at the moment we now live in. It's a privilege to live this, through this period, because it's a period of greater technological advance than humanity has ever witnessed. And to understand what's going on in the world of technology, certainly the way I explain it, you need to know four things are happening. The first is that the underpinning technologies, the technologies that underpin everything we do when we turn on our machine or use our computers or our handhelds, they're growing at an exponential, a literally exponential explosive rate. So whether or not you're talking about processing power or bandwidth or hard disk capacity or memory, and you don't even need to understand the concepts. All these enablers are growing at this explosive rate. So last year was the first year where the average laptop could process at about the speed of 10 to the 16th or 10 to the 17th calculations per second. That's about the same processing power as the human brain. So just hold that thought for a second. In 1965, a man called Gordon Moore, uh, who's one of the co-founders of Intel, he came up with what he called Moore's Law. And this was the prediction that every 18 months or two years or so, this is an approximation of what he said, every 18 months or two years or so, computing power would double. And people said, well, that won't last for very long. And even if it does, that's not significant. Well, that has continued to happen since 1965. And if you can keep doubling anything, it gives rise to this explosive, and unfortunately, it's a curve we're all familiar with through COVID, this exponential curve. The best story about exponential growth is the story of the tramp and the princess. The tramp saves the princess's life. The king says to the tramp, I'll give you anything in the kingdom as a reward. Uh, the tramp, it turns out, a mathematically astute tramp, says, what I'd like is a chessboard. In the first square, I'd like to put one grain of rice. The second, double it to two. The third, double it to four. The fourth, to eight. The fifth, to 16. And all I would ask for my reward is that you keep doubling across the squares of the chessboard. The king, who's not mathematically astute, says, I grant you that wish. But it turns out it's not his to grant, because to double across all 64 squares would require more rice th than there is in planet Earth. You have this amazing explosive growth. And what we're now in the second half of the chessboard when it comes to processing power. So although we've come to a stage where processing power is very modest in 65 when Moore made his predictions, to a time today where the processing power is about the same processing speed as the human brain, if Moore's law continues, and anyone who follows, uh, for example, quantum computing will believe it will continue, by, by 2050, well within the lifetime of many people in this room, the average laptop computer will have more processing power than all of humanity combined. This is not science fiction. I'm not making it up. This is the maths and the physics involved. The second factor is our machines, in turn, are becoming increasingly capable. Hardly a day passes that we don't hear news of some system, technology, app, breakthrough, startup, and so forth. And what we're more than that reading about is systems that are taking on many tasks that historically we thought could only be undertaken by human beings. 
And this takes us into the whole world of artificial intelligence, which is why I came in in the 80s. I wrote my PhD in AI and law in Oxford. So this has been, this is my fifth decade. Uh, it seems remarkable for me, but it's fifth decade of working on AI and law. And this is the only decade I've felt able to say this, that this is the decade where legal and court service will be transformed by artificial intelligence. I've never felt this before. A word of warning, most of the pundits who are talking about AI, I think, hugely overstate its short-term impact. But at the same time, what everyone, almost everyone does, is hugely understates its long-term impact. Will AI transform the law over the next couple of years? Not at all. By 2030, almost certainly yes. If you study that field deeply and you see the trends, we are just, this is why I say it's so lucky for us to be alive at this period. This is the period during which our machines are becoming increasingly capable, and that involves taking on many of the tasks that we thought historically could only be undertaken by human lawyers. Our machines are also becoming increasingly pervasive, and I'm not just meaning the handhelds and the tablets that we use, also the internet of things. This move towards embedding chips in everyday objects that can communicate with one another and communicate with us as human beings. And we as human beings are becoming increasingly connected, communicating, collaborating, cooperating in new ways enabled through technology. And gosh, we've seen this through the COVID period, haven't we? Haven't we? How important it was that we could communicate in new ways. Anytime you use a video conference system, incidentally, just think this. This is the worst it's ever going to be from now on. These technologies are only moving in one direction because the kicker in all of this is there's no finishing line. No one in China or Silicon Valley or South Korea is dusting their hands off and saying, job done, that's technology looked after, let's move on to something else. Quite the reverse, the pace of change is accelerating. And for me, at once the most exhilarating and yet disarming thought is this. I can't prove this, but I, I know it in my heart that by 2030, all of our lives will have been changed by technologies that haven't yet been invented. You only need to look at what's happened over the last 20 years and the changes of that sort that have happened. It's bizarre to think at a time when the pace of change is accelerating that somehow there won't be any new developments. So to understand the future, you don't simply extrapolate from what we have today. Somehow you've got to take account of these as yet uninvented technologies. As for artificial intelligence, there's two waves of AI and law. I was involved in the first wave, there's now a second wave. I don't have time to unpack each in detail. But in the first wave, essentially, we developed systems like huge decision trees. We took complex areas of law and we allowed people to roam through complex areas of law by answering a series of questions. We now have systems that do something quite different. They learn from huge amounts of data. And I know that's not a rather abstract thing to say, the best way I have of explaining this is like the way we learn a language. So the way I learned French at school, very poorly, I have to say, was like we learned a list of words, which is called the vocabulary. You learned the rules of grammar, and you were meant to put the two together. And as I say, it didn't go so well for me. I had a couple of friends who went to Paris for the summer, and they came back completely fluent in their oral uh, French, at least. Interestingly, of course, they hadn't learned lists of words. They didn't know the rules of grammar. They've absorbed huge amounts of data. Now, we as human beings, Chomsky, the linguist, writes about this. We have this ability, if we absorb huge amounts of linguistic data, to convert it into an ability to speak different languages. We seem to be hardwired to do that. Machine learning is quite similar. The algorithms that you hear about are, is the software that computer scientists design to help machines absorb and make sense of huge amounts of data. And the biggest way they make sense of these data is by enabling them to make predictions. So a system now, for example, in medicine, that can look at a lesion, a mole, and tell more accurately than a dermatologist whether or not that lesion is cancerous. The system knows nothing about histopathology or dermatology or medical science. It's got 127,000 images of past lesions together with the results of the pathology, and by a form of, very crudely speaking, partial pattern matching, a kind of computational statistic, it's got a new lesion it can predict more accurately than using the medical method. We all accept it in medicine. So let's think about Lex Machina, a system also developed by Stanford University, of which it's said that it can predict the outcome of patent disputes in the United States more accurately than any patent lawyer. The interesting thing, again, is it knows nothing about patent law. It doesn't search across the full text of judgments, although some machine learning systems do, but this one doesn't. 
What it does is it has about 200,000 records of past cases, who the judge was, which law firm was involved, the lawyer involved, the nature of the claim, the size of the claim. This is very, I think, disconcerting for lawyers. But it turns out if you have enough quantities of, very large quantities of past data about court behavior, you can make more accurate predictions about court outcomes than by using the legal method. Now, many lawyers say to me, this is dangerous. The system knows nothing about uh, this no system knows nothing about patent law. But I go back to the question that every lawyer asks, or sorry, rather every client asks, when there's a dispute coming over the horizon. What's our chances of winning? Abraham Maslow, the great organizational psychologist, once said, if you're a hammer, everything looks like a nail. So I always think if you're a lawyer, everything looks like a legal problem. But note, when the client asks what's our chances of winning, they're probably agnostic to the method used to, do, to answer that question. And if demonstrably over time, a computer system can make the prediction more accurately than lawyers, and it's a key role of lawyers, you'll see what economists call task substitution, a task of the lawyer will be replaced by the machine. And that in microcosm is what you're seeing right across the professions. You're seeing lots of tasks that we used to think required human intelligence being undertaken by machines. And the key point to notice here is this one. These machines do not copy us. They don't work in the way we do. So you might be thinking, hang on a second, he doesn't really understand what, I'm a what I do as a lawyer. I think, I reason, I'm creative. No machine can ever do that. Uh, that's to commit the AI fallacy, as I call it, the mistaken belief that the only way you can get machines to perform at a high standard is by copying the way we do it. Uh, as a leading AI scientist, Patrick Winston, once said to us, there's many ways of being smart that isn't smart or aren't smart like us. There are, the power of these machines is that they have phenomenal processing power. They can operate in huge amounts of data empowered by remarkable algorithms. This is not a replication or a copy of what we do. And so when the, it's easier to understand in medicine because it's not so personally challenging, but that system is not replicating the reasoning of an expert doctor. It's harnessing data in an entirely different way. So you'll be inclined to say things like, ah, yes, but hang on a second, a machine can't be creative. So think of the game of Go. Go is a board game uh, very popular in Korea and China. Uh, more permutations in Go than there are atoms in the universe. That's how complicated it is. About eight years ago, leading AI scientists said it'll be a decade before a computer system could play a good game of Go. And then two years later, AlphaGo, a system developed by the UK-based DeepMind company owned by Google, AlphaGo beat the world Go champion four games to one. I want you to think of the second game and the 37th move. You can see it in Google, uh, on YouTube. System moves the piece. Commentators think the move is a mistake. A Go champion later describes the move as beautiful and said it brought a tear to his eye. No human being had ever thought of that move before. In a human being, we would have called it creative. We may even have called it genius. It was none of these things. It was brute processing power, lots of data, clever algorithms. And that's the world we're moving into, ladies and gentlemen, a world where this combination, this trinity, of processing data and algorithms will mean that much that we thought was uniquely human will no longer be conscious of time. But let me try and put a little bit of structure in this in terms of the future of legal services. When I wrote about this in 1996 in my book, The Future of Law, and I still think this, um, I think the best way of understanding is, is, is in terms of legal anthropology or anthropology generally and four phases of humanity. We've moved from a, an era of orality to an era of script, to an era of print. And now we are well on the way moving from a print-based industrial society to a technology-based digital society. But the important thing to notice is in each of these different epochs, in each, the way in which we created information and communicated information, I call that the information substructure, determine things like the quantity of our law, the complexity of our law, the regularity with which the law would change, the way the law is promulgated, the way disputes are resolved, and who can understand and even apply the law. How the law is administered in society is to a very large extent dictated by the information substructure. That's to say by the dominant way 
we create and communicate information. As that shift, you've got to accept a huge, expect a huge shift in the way administer, we administer law. And the fascinating practical outcome of this is going to be a shift from an era when only lawyers could understand and apply the law to a time when anyone in the world will be able to understand and apply the law. And this, for me, is the access to justice story. When people talk about increasing access to justice, many judges and lawyers are talking about increasing access to our conventional courts. Mm. I'm talking about putting online systems that help people understand their legal rights and entitlements, that help them understand the options available to them, that help them marshal their arguments, that help them organize their evidence. We have technologies available that can help do that just now. According to the OECD, less than half of the people in the world have realistic access to lawyers and courts. Less than half of the people in the world live under the protection of the law. We are not going to sort that out by throwing more lawyers and more judges and more courts at the problem. But we're fortunate because we live in an era as we transition from a print-based industrial society to a digital society that these technologies are going to enable people. And this is not just a story about law. It's about medicine. It's about education. It's about reaching billions of more people who have access to technology. 59% of people now in our world have access to the internet. 46% of people have access to justice. That 59% is growing far more rapidly. The worry is the 46% is shrinking. So that's the future as I see it, that we are, and that's what my book, Online Courts, is all about. You have to reconceptualize what it is we do when we're resolving a dispute. Ask the question, is court a service or a place? Do we really need physically to congregate in an old building to resolve, for example, small civil matters? We know that even in this country, and we're one of the best in the world, resolving a civil dispute takes too long, costs too much. The process is unintelligible unless you're a lawyer. It's way too combative. It's disproportionate. And, it's, and for most younger people, it's out of step in a digital society. And we're about as good as it comes. And so I'm saying this is not a question of automating, streamlining, improving, enhancing, supporting our old system through technology. It's about fundamentally transforming. And that's the story. I don't think books are going to disappear. But I think the way in which people will understand and enforce their entitlements will naturally, in a digital society, be mediated through a variety of technologies. We are living through, though, a transitional period. And certainly through this transitional period, books are going to be absolutely vital. I just want to close again by saying it's a privilege to be alive at this time. And the decision for all of you in the room is the same, the same career decision. I say this particularly to young people who potentially have got fantastic traditional legal careers ahead of you. But do you want to compete with these emerging systems or do you want to build them? And by the emerging systems, what we're seeing right across society, right across all economies, we're developing systems that replace our old ways of working. That's how our world is unfolding. By competing, you're saying, I hear everything Richard said, but I quite fancy being a traditional lawyer, and there's lot, despite what he says, there's lots, of, lots I could do that a machine will never be able to do, and that's what I want to do in my career. I'm not saying you're wrong, but you're pushing against the, you're, pushing against the tide there. If you look at any labor economist's analysis of the division of labor between human beings and machines represented as a pie chart, the slice for the machines is getting bigger and the slice for human beings is getting smaller. We may lament or regret that, but that's the direction of travel. But, but why would you not want to be involved directly in building the systems that replace our old ways of working? These ways of working that are creaking is given, I say again to young people in the room, is given to very few generations of lawyers to come in and actually be involved in changing the system. And that's the opportunity that's afforded to you. I think the spirit of this organization, though, even when law books are not used as a resource by people who are trying to understand their access and to, uh, who are trying to understand their entitlements and enforce their entitlements, I think that spirit can live on in digital. And going back to my earlier point, I don't think we should see this organization in opposition to technology. We should see, or we should ask ourselves the question, how can we preserve the spirit of this organization in making content available electronically? Thank you very much.